Uh, decisions that are made today apparently have consequences uh, for emissions for several decades to come, and, and this makes it very difficult to wait for uh, the climate concerns, environment concerns currently on the B list until it comes up to the A list, then it's like already too late. So how might countries start now to address their, their current economic problems at the same time, take steps towards uh, some type of low carbon development? Per, please, enlighten us. Um, at least I get the prize for the longest title, right? <laughs> um, which perhaps reflects that I'm about to talk for about four minutes about um, a report that was more like 400 pages. And so I will provide only a snapshot here. Um, that will all be all too easy to, uh, to, uh, to see that it requires a lot more elaboration. But the, the heart of the question that we're trying to address in this session was really also the question that was asked by a project that SCI uh, entered into to, with, together with partners from around the world called the New Climate Economy Project. And it reported um, on behalf of a global commission um, in September last year. And they tried to ask these questions, how countries can address their current growth and development and well-being concerns while also moving towards uh, future lower greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, the, it, it came out of an observation that a lot of the, the narrative, the way we talk, who talks about climate, who does not, who talks, uh, it, it's very negative in many ways. It's about burden sharing, it's about all the complexities that we heard in the sessions before lunch. Um, so it tried to approach it from a different angle. Um, it tried to start maybe from the fact that the business as usual, addressing the A-list if you like, is no such thing as business as usual. It's about deep structural change. So in poor countries, it's about uh, addressing poverty, poverty, poverty alleviation. It is also about achieving sustained uh, improvement in, in well-being and living conditions. In middle-income countries, there is almost no middle-income country that does not very, have a very live debate about the middle-income trap the fact that only 10 to 15 countries in the last four decades or so have ever escaped from middle income to high income status. Um, in high income countries, it might be about new sources of growth or population aging or any other number of concerns. And the common theme here is that there's a lot of structural change that's going to happen in these economies. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to talk about a lot of the report. I'm just going to show one, one slide, one way, one framework that we try to use to think about this. Because if there's one, we don't really know what successful countries that do well for their, for their people will look like in, in years to come. But for example, we do know that they will have great cities. They will be cities that have agglomeration effects that allow them to grow and multiply um, productivity of different sectors. They will be nice to live in and attract talent. Uh, they will not have large so social divisions and, uh, and slums. And they will not have be heavy pollution. They will not have enormous congestion and they will not have large amounts of traffic accidents. And they will not perhaps also have large, very structural exposure in their transport systems or buildings to fossil fuel expenditures. And so, tell, it's, it's seeing the different examples of how policymakers are wrestling with this story for cities, um, tells you a story both about a destination you want to head to solve your economic development needs, in, given that urbanization is a major force behind economic growth and access to new services, etc. And it also has an enormous importance for greenhouse gases. And similar stories can be told for land use or for energy. Um, and across these three systems then, we see the elements of something that leads to either good or bad growth. And it is not just GDP, it's well-being more broadly. And we also see the elements in these three systems uh, of very different greenhouse gas emissions trajectories. Um, across, cutting across all these, are three categories of, of the different things that this, we try to talk about. Resource efficiency, which is really, you could call it productivity if you like, but we see that there, is in, there are enormous differences in how well different countries and different cities and others perform on this, in this dimension across all of these three systems. We see investment in infrastructure has been one of the things we talked about here, making it happen and making it in the right way. And of course, innovation as well. Um, with a large this set of solutions that exist to the different problems that we have is shifting quite rapidly. And it's not necessarily just renewable energy becoming cheaper. It's also innovation in material science or in, in, uh, in ICT uh, in, uh, that, that become platforms for new, new ways of doing things from agricultural supply chains to other things. Mm -hmm. And so this provides a, a basis for conversation and a basis for painting a picture where we can step step onto a different trajectory. 
Um, and so maybe we could have time to talk more about it right. in a little bit, but that's, that's a snapshot of some of the things we talked about in this project. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Per. Um...